Okay, I guess we can get started. Uh, we're here today, I guess, to mark the denouement of uh, the Pioneer Venus mission. Uh, the Orbiter spacecraft has uh, been operating near flawlessly for 14 years. Personally, I uh, feel some uh, sense of regret since I've been with this since the beginning. Uh, and I also, uh, I think, most knowledgeable observers, most knowledgeable people feel that, that uh, this is one of the most cost-effective projects that NASA has had. It didn't, wasn't expensive and it did a lot. Uh, the, uh, this uh, the occasion today is uh, being broadcast on NASA Select, so when you ask questions, please identify yourself. We have uh, press kits, photos, and video out in the lobby. Um, we're going to have, a, we will have some quick look science today, but we'll have a full up science briefing in a month or so, uh, giving the science results of the near close skimming in of Venus's atmosphere over the last month. Um, at the end of this, for news media, we'll be showing a video background uh, tape. That will be after everything else is over, so don't tune out. Um, I'd like to introduce today uh, Jack Fisher from uh, Hughes Aircraft Company, who built this wonderful spacecraft. Uh, Jack was systems engineering manager through thick and thin during the mission, or during the preparation of the hardware. Uh, Paul Cloutier from uh, Rice University, who has the ion mass spectrometer, and uh, Bill Knudsen from Lockheed, who has a retarding, retarding potential analyzer. Uh, and now to introduce the panel, uh, uh, from your left, uh, Richard Fimmel, the Pioneer Project Manager, uh, Jack Dyer, who's the navigator, on the mission, and also the Deputy Chief of the Space Projects Division at Ames. Jerry Keating from, uh, from uh, Langley Research Center, who has the gravity experiment, the atmosphere density experiment, excuse me. Uh, Larry Brace uh, from Goddard Space Flight Center in the University of Michigan. Uh, what's your experiment, Jerry, Larry? <laughs> Electron temperature probe. The electron temperature probe, and uh, uh, Bob Strangeway from UCLA, who's uh, uh, handling the lightning data. Uh, so, Richard, if you want to begin. Okay. Good morning. <clears throat> Start out by pointing out that the spacecraft has basically been healthy. All the science instruments, with the exception of the infrared radiometer, were okay. That failed fairly early in the mission, but lasted through the primary part of it. And we were not using the radar instruments because of the fine job being done by Magellan, also partly because of lack of power. The total science instrument complement has been gathering data around Venus daily, except for a short period when we converted it to a Cometali mission. We turned the spacecraft clock in 270 degrees and imaged the Halley's Comet in the ultraviolet. Now, initially, Pioneer Venus Orbiter was required to last one Venus day, or 243 Earth days. It's done a little better than that. It's lasted 14 years and five months, 5,226 days, or over 21 times the, that length of time. This has been an enormously successful and productive mission. The spacecraft could have gone on longer, but we're out of fuel. Interesting fact, the total mission cost for the orbiter and mission operations <clears throat> has been about $170 million. That translates to about 68 cents per person in the United States. The operations part of that translate into less than two and a half cents per year per person in the United States. I think that's a pretty good record. It launched on the 20th of May in 1978 and was inserted in orbit on the 6th of December that same year. Now, in spite of the fact that we're sad at the loss of an old friend, 
On the other hand, the high science productivity gives us really great cause for satisfaction and a job well done. Jack Dyer will tell you a little more about some of the things we've been doing with it recently. Um, a big part, but by no means all of the science of the Pioneer Venus Orbiter was to examine directly the ionosphere and upper atmosphere of Venus with uh, instruments uh, designed to uh, sample it. And when Pioneer Venus Orbiter was built, it was uh, felt that we could get down to about 155 kilometers, about 100 miles uh, altitude. Uh, when the spacecraft was placed into orbit at Venus, a highly elliptical orbit, uh, we, we controlled it by pulling it down against the solar gravitational effect, uh, which tended to raise the altitude of closest approach. Uh, we did that, uh, feeling our way down literally, and found that in the day side, where the atmosphere is warmer and puffed up, that we could actually get down to 152 kilometers with the criteria of safety we had set for ourselves. Uh, on the dark side, where it was colder, we found we could actually get down to about 140 kilometers. It was uh, very satisfying all around, and we did that for about a year and a half until about 90% of the liquid fuel on board the spacecraft had been used. At that point, we kept the remainder so that we keep, could keep control of the orientation of the spin axis, which affects communication, and also the uh, spin rate of the spacecraft uh, for whatever remained of its life. To our spectacular surprise, uh, what remained of its life was all of the time the uh, sun's gravity would permit it to uh, orbit Venus, which uh, came to about last September 7th, at which point it was uh, descending uh, again at a pretty good rate, uh, thanks to the sun's gravitational influence, uh, into uh, Venus' atmosphere. On September 7th, then, we began to use the last, what now is about uh, 6 or 8 percent of the propellant, having used some in the interim to do a little housekeeping uh, and, and to look at uh, Halley's Comet, as uh, Richard mentioned, and, and another comet. Uh, and, but we began to use, then, what remained of the fuel to uh, raise the altitude of periaps. We did that on a five-day cycle, and in doing it, we allowed it to go deeper than it had before. We finally were able to realize the wishes of, of several of the scientists who, whose whole focus was uh, to get as deep as we could and learn as much as we could about the, other, the upper atmosphere, some of which you'll hear about in the, uh, uh, from the scientists to, to follow me. Uh, and uh, in that process, uh, we went another five or six miles deep, uh, perhaps ten times more dense, uh, atmosphere taking greater risk, uh, approaching the ultimate uh, calculated temperatures that we thought the outer surfaces of the spacecraft could stand without uh, uh, serious destruction. Uh, we had hoped we might get through nine cycles, but it's a very difficult thing to measure how much propellant was available, and after we got started it was very encouraging because the changes in pressure in the tank were such that it looked like we would make it through nine cycles which would let the spacecraft survive to December, which was far, far beyond our hopes. But it turns out, uh, like in old cars, the gas gauge, having sat there for 12 years at one setting, uh, apparently shifted a bit. And uh, uh, last, uh, uh, last Thursday evening, uh, we saw signs that uh, we were out of gas. And we thought that was a bubble on Friday evening. We tried some tests that indicated that no, in fact, we might be out of gas, but uh, we had just elevated it, so we knew it would last a few more days. Uh, on, uh, over the weekend, we realized that there were about four ounces available in the plumbing on the opposite side of the spacecraft, and uh, in order to extend it as long as possible, in case we were wrong in our calculations as to how long it would last, uh, we spun it up further so that the communications angles would hold up in spite of the intense drag that it would encounter before it died. And that was done Monday night. Uh, then we thought maybe that would shake out a few drops of propellant in the very low uh, rotational acceleration field out to the side of the spacecraft where we could increase its altitude some more. And we were able to do that on Wednesday, uh, raised it another uh, kilometer with, we think, about six-tenths of an ounce that uh, rolled out there to uh, that thruster. And in that process, improved further the communications angle. But uh, by then, we had gotten uh, somewhat past, uh, well past, really, our calculated uh, resistance of the materials to temperature. And uh, yesterday on Thursday, uh, when it went behind the, the planet and through its lowest passage, it apparently died because we were unable to communicate with it after that. But uh, we had uh, gotten uh, data very, very much deeper 
than uh, we had ever expected. I have a pl I don't know what the arrangements here are for for seeing visuals. Can this be seen, Pete? Uh, it can seem to be seen by the show. All right. This, I'm sorry about the size. This is a plot of the altitude uh, as a function of day. Each dot represents a, an altitude of periaps. The uh, dot with the arrow is dated October 7th and is the, uh, represents the altitude of periaps on the date when uh, we had our last successful pa pass. And the next, the lower plot, uh, the, pardon me, the, the next and lowest dot is the uh, altitude uh, that we did not survive. Uh, those altitudes are 129 kilometers and 128 kilometers. And you can see that the be, this distance between the last two dots was shortened up a little bit by my mentioning of the 6 tenths ounce uh, that we found. Uh, but uh, we cut it so fine, apparently, that uh, it survived one and not, not the neighbor. And that's all I have. Before we go ahead, uh, since our project scientist can't be here, Pete Waller is going to report on some of the things that he would have reported to us, and then we'll continue. Well, I, I talked to several experimenters who couldn't be here. Uh, Ian Stewart at the uh, University of Colorado, who has the ultraviolet instrument, uh, saw a glow from the spacecraft uh, in uh, the last three passes into Venus's atmosphere, I guess, due to the friction with the atmosphere. And uh, Ian got a, a, a spectrum, and I said, what did it mean? And he said he didn't have any idea. Uh, <laughs> I'd never seen anything like it before. I have, anyway, I have his phone number. The uh, Hasso Neiman at Goddard Space Flight Center's neutral mass spectrometer and uh, Bill Knudsen's retarding potential analyzer showed a lot of ions, which they will be analyzing and, and which they expected to get, both from the spacecraft and from being lower in Venus's atmosphere. Uh, Chris Russell's magnetometer, Chris is at UCLA, showed uh, very, very low magnetic field. Uh, this has to do uh, uh, largely, I gather, with the phase of the solar cycle. Uh, anyway, uh, I can uh, give you information on how to reach these people. And uh, that's it. So uh, if you want to go ahead, Jerry. Jerry? OK, I'm Jerry Keating from NASA Langley Research Center. And I'm the principal investigator on the orbiter atmospheric drag experiment. Uh, we look at how the orbit shrinks with time, how the period changes with time. And from that, we can determine densities in the vicinity of what is called periapsis, which is the closest approach of the satellite orbit to the, uh, to the planet. <clears throat> and that uh, closest approach changes altitude, as Jack has been saying. Um, and. Um, we uh, can then get the vertical structure of the atmosphere by looking at how the uh, density varies uh, with altitude. Uh, knowing how the density varies with altitude, we can make estimates of the temperature of the atmosphere and also the composition. Um, the other thing which we have uh, been doing is helping Jack estimate uh, when we should, be able to, should pull out of the atmosphere up to a higher altitude. Uh, and we normally, within about one rev of burning the uh, coatings on the outside of the satellite. So it's, uh, it's been critical that we uh, obtain these uh, drag measurements um, uh, within hours of the time of the next uh, pass. Um, I'd like to show you, uh, if you can see this, um, uh, something that kind of summarizes what we've been able to see from um, uh, on Venus from uh, looking at the vertical structure from the drag measurements. Um, uh, what I show you here is the uh, altitude versus temperature of the satellite. And um, this is Venus uh, temperatures as a function of altitude. Over here is the Earth temperatures. And you can see that in the upper atmosphere, the Venus is very cold compared to Earth. While down at the surface, of course, Venus is very, very hot. It'll melt lead. And so you have the, the opposite effect of the surface as you have up at the higher altitudes. Um, we were very surprised 
at the extraordinarily low temperatures that we found on Venus, uh, 300 Kelvin on the uh, day side upper atmosphere and about a 100 Kelvin on the night side. Uh, the, remember, this is closer to the sun than we are, and it's, so it's surprising that it's so much, uh, so very, very cold. Um, we have uh, studied uh, during this entry phase the day side uh, temperatures, trying to understand why they're as cold as they are. Uh, theoretical predictions would indicate without extra cooling mechanisms that you would have uh, considerably warmer temperatures than what we see here. So now we have isolated this, we think, as uh, being uh, due to very, very strong radiative cooling uh, by CO2. And uh, this uh, results from atomic oxygen exciting uh, CO2 into very, very strong emission. This same effect can happen on the Earth. And uh, as we double CO2 over the next century, um, we should expect to see substantial cooling of the upper atmosphere of the Earth up at uh, these uh, same altitudes. This has nothing to do with what's happening at the surface of the Earth, uh, but up at uh, satellite altitudes. And we probably will see uh, these large drops in temperature in the upper atmosphere uh, before we are sure of the increases of temperature down at the surface of the planet. Uh, the other thing which we are looking at is the night side of Venus. And the night side, the temperature actually drops off with altitude. Uh, this is uh, unique in the whole solar system. Uh, every place else, the temperature rises with altitude, the, the temperature of the neutral upper atmosphere. And when it rises, it's called the thermosphere. We now call this region where it drops off the cryosphere. And um, um, so we've detected this with the uh, drag measurements. Uh, in, the, in the early phase of the mission, we could only measure the cryosphere near 150 kilometers. Now we've been able to measure the cryosphere down below 130 kilometers with the final measurements that we uh, had in the last week. And then we have been able to obtain measurements above 200 kilometers. So we have a, a picture of the uh, entire structure. Uh, up above 200 kilometers, we've been able to obtain measurements of densities lower than ever achieved before uh, by radio science. Um, I'd like to just close by showing you uh, some of the uh, latest results which we have obtained. This is the last density which we could obtain before the uh, spacecraft lost control. Um, and it turns out that this density here is at about, as Jack says, about 129 kilometers. Uh, and a density at 129 here is a little bit higher than you find on planet Earth at 129. Uh, however, the densities drop off many orders of magnitude as you go up in altitude. So by the time you go from 130 kilometers to up to 210, there's a, a drop in density of about a factor of a million uh, because we have this 100 degree Kelvin uh, atmosphere on uh, planet Venus. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, I'm Larry Brace, uh, University of Michigan. Um, I have the uh, <coughs> orbiter electron temperature probe. That's a Langmuir probe that measures the ionospheric temperature and density. Uh, I don't really want to talk about uh, science results here. I think uh, I think you, uh, when you came in, you got a press handout that had uh, this brochure in it, and it's got a lot of the uh, images and uh, and diagrams and pictures uh, that we have up here on the on the display. Um, the one in the middle there that looks like a comet is, it represents the area I'm primarily interested in, and that's the uh, upper atmosphere, the aronomy, the solar wind interactions with the high upper atmosphere, the ionized portion of it. Uh, when the sun uh, hits the atmosphere, it ionizes it and breaks it up into ions and, and electrons and dissociates it and produces some very interesting and uh, important um, uh, physical processes that occur not just at Venus, but uh, throughout the universe, and uh, in particular uh, in, uh, in our atmosphere. Uh, and the thing I wanted to stress at this point wasn't so much what we've learned at Venus in the last 14 years, you can read about that, but uh, why we do this kind of thing. Well, why Venus? Uh, why do we want to uh, study other atmospheres? Well, I think the answer is fairly obvious to uh, anyone who's thought about it, that um, when you try to understand an atmosphere, uh, particularly our atmosphere, we've been working on it longest because it's closer to us and has it has more impact on our our well-being. Uh, uh, we breathe it and we stay alive because of that. So we're we're somewhat more interested in the Earth's atmosphere than than that of other planets. 
but the same physics goes on at all the planets. Uh, and uh, we've generated mathematical models that contain that physics and applied them uh, with the help of knowledge of our own atmosphere from satellites and rockets and ground-based measurements. Uh, and we think we have a, a pretty good mathematical model of various, various aspects of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, on the other hand, we don't know because we've tuned those models to, uh, to uh, match what we know about the atmosphere. And in tuning them, uh, in tuning the, the processes of adjusting rate coefficients and, uh, and trying to understand circulation, we introduce certain factors that explain the data but aren't necessarily physical. We don't really understand uh, all of the physics that's going on in our atmosphere. But we know the same physics goes on everywhere in the solar system, and so when we go to places like Venus and Mars and, and make measurements in that atmosphere, it gives us a different uh, combination of physical processes, the same, the same physics but different combinations, and allows us to test these theories that we think work and know work fairly well at Earth. And sometimes there are surprises. Uh, uh, and uh, there have been surprises at, at Venus, uh, and, and there have been some surprises at Mars, although we don't know very much about Mars. The next mission we hope to do in this area is a mission to Mars to try to understand, to get data that we can further test the models uh, at, uh, with. Uh, now, you, you may ask, why do we need models, or who cares uh, whether or not we can explain the atmosphere? We can measure it. Um, but that isn't really enough. Uh, in order to, um, to understand what humans are doing to our atmosphere, uh, we need to have greater confidence that, uh, uh, that the models can actually predict what happens in, uh, in changing conditions, like greater CO2 uh, emission from burning fossil fuels and, uh, and the effects of uh, ozone on, on the Earth's atmosphere that we think may be important uh, because of chlorophoro uh, uh, carbons uh, uh, cooling um, uh, uh, fluids. Uh, those, those are social decisions, or those are policy decisions that have to be made. The government has to decide whether to spend money uh, on those um, problems, whether they really are problems. Unless we understand in detail, really understand what physics is going on and can test it and make it, make it work on other atmospheres, uh, some people are going to be reticent to, be, to understand that there may be a problem. On the other hand, some of the problems we foresee now I think when, once we understand the atmosphere better, will turn out not to be a problem. And we probably shouldn't be worrying about some of them as much as we are. But without firm knowledge, uh, it's difficult to make policy decisions on, uh, to, on, on how far we should go uh, to solve problems that appear to be important now. So I'd like to leave it with that, that studying other atmospheres is part of a broader, a broader interest in atmospheres. We have uh, obvious uh, uh, human reasons for want wanting to know uh, the physics better. Uh, and uh, that's about as far as I'd like to take that, uh, that discussion. Thank you, Larry. Bob Strangeway? Well, I'm Bob Strangeway from UCLA, and I'm here basically to try and uh, give you a sense of some of the science that we're doing right now. And uh, this is very quick look and very preliminary, but the issue I'm going to talk about is the issue of whether or not the Pioneer Venus uh, orbiter has actually detected lightning at Venus. A little bit of history is that early in the mission, Fred Scarf, who was the principal investigator on the plasma wave instrument, the orbiter electric field detector, measured wave bursts at lowest altitude in the 100 hertz channel, which is designed to west measure whistler mode waves, and said that these are due to lightning. Chris Russell and colleagues at UCLA looked at higher frequency signals and also said these are due to lightning. Now, Paul Cloutier and Harry Taylor have gone to, have, have basically have questioned these interpretations and have argued that the, the signals that were attributed to lightning are in fact due to an interaction in the ionosphere, not in the atmosphere. So one of the pieces of information that we wanted to get from this in entry phase mission is to determine whether or not the signals are due to lightning by seeing if we see the signals at lowest altitude, we get down to the altitudes we've never been before with the orbiter. I have some very preliminary results which I will discuss here, and I do want to emphasize that they are preliminary. The 100 hertz channel, this is the channel that measures these things known as Whistler mode waves, does measure signals at lowest altitude. They're very sporadic, they're not seen in every orbit, and this suggests that they are real as opposed to something that's generated by the spacecraft itself interacting with the ionosphere and atmosphere. In that regard, they could be due to lightning. 
The high frequency signals are also detected, but not at lowest altitude, not at periapsis. They're often seen at about the same altitude inbound and outbound on each, each orbit. And this would suggest rather that it was a local source of these signals rather than a lightning source. I do want to emphasize again that these statements are preliminary. Uh, the spacecraft itself does create its own plasma environment as it rounds through the atmosphere. And at least some of this response could be due to the, how the instrument itself responds to that plasma environment. If these results do stand up under more detailed analysis, and I look forward to collaborating with Paul Cloutier, amongst others, on this, I would state that the, both the pro and anti-lightning camps have in fact, are in fact correct. We do see lightning in the 100 hertz Whistler channel, but the high frequency silent signals are almost certainly contaminated by some local source. So in closing, I would just want to say I would like to thank both the Pioneer Venus op, uh, Missions Office and the operations personnel for all the incredible work they've done over the last 14 years. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, about three and a half kilometers. This is the scale height is, is uh, the altitude over which the density drops by a factor of e, and uh, so it drops very very fast. Uh, about three and a half kilometers at e this altitude. Is two point seven. Yeah. Is e? Yeah. <coughs> Just to clarify, one uh, uh, and please identify yourself. I'm John um, Just the, the instruments are no longer functioning, but the spacecraft has not uh, has not entered or, or, or landed or burned up yet, and it won't do so until the 20th. Approximately the 20th. Yeah, that's our estimate. I, I I've got a picture here uh, of uh, this is an estimate based upon a calculation of JPL. Um, of um, yeah, of um, of how the altitude will vary from uh, about now. I guess we start this. Uh, here is October the eighth, so it drops on down to about 119 kilometers, and then stays at about that altitude until uh, the period decays down from 24 hours on down to essentially zero hours, and then it comes on in. Uh, so it depends upon exactly what the atmosphere is below us. I and mean, we've been exploring the atmosphere at different altitudes, so we don't really know exactly what the properties are at these lower altitudes. So, Will you know? Unlikely. I, I mean, unless a miracle occurs and we are able to uh, hear from the spacecraft again, we will never know. No. Most unlikely. Right. <laughs> You said you expect the experiments are working, the, the, the instruments. No, are not working. Oh, okay, fine. You know that they are not because you're not... Oh, you no. Know All we know is we have no radio communications. Uh, if we assume that that's due to the heating effect of drag, which, which I do, uh, I think a lot of things are failing to function rather quickly. Today, for example, it will pass uh, through an even denser atmosphere and be cooked uh, more than it was yesterday, the whole spacecraft. Uh, so uh, we're, the, Jerry's chart, I think, uh, eventually is a hunk of whatever's left. Not only that, as the power declines, of course, the transmitter and everything else will stop functioning. Could you, um, but when, you, when it looks like this, you're probably down about, uh, this is about October the 20th here. <laughs> <laughs> In that, in that handout that we were given when we walked in, it's dated September 1st, and, and you were explaining uh, the five-day cycle that you were hoping, anticipating to go through, through possibly up through December or into December. Could you run, could somebody run through again why you, why it didn't go through that cycle? Why, why? It sounded to me like you guys were playing chicken and, and cutting it lower every time how close you could get and finally you went as close as you could and, that, and, and that's a but this interesting thing about the fuel and not not having anticipated that you were down as low on fuel as you could. I think I should deal with that. First, first of all we're pretty surprised the spacecraft lasted this long. <laughs> The uh, decline in altitude due to the solar gravity's effect on the orbit, it, it has a, a long-term evolutionary, if you will, uh, effect on the orbit. Um, 
we, we have always known would bring it down to this altitude at this time. Um, knowing how much propellant remains is very, very difficult because it's measured by measuring the pressure of the gas. And when the 60 pounds or 70 pounds, which was it, Jack? 70, 70 pounds of fluid uh, is uh, nearly exhausted. It's, re it's replaced by the expansion of the gas that pressurized it in the beginning, the, the same number of molecules of gas. Uh, so that of liquid fuel, of liquid fuel. and that filled about two thirds of the volume of the tank, the other third being uh, filled with pressurized helium. That same helium, the same quantity, then when the tank is nearly empty, uh, the pressure of that is measured, and um, the instrumentation on that pressure. Uh, has steps. It, it reports out digitally, and between the steps are about two psi. When the tank is full, two two pounds change in pressure in in 400 ps was it 300 350 psi represents a rather small amount of fluid. But when the tank's almost empty, it re represents a lot of fluid. So we spent a lot of time, as a matter of fact, when we. Uh, we're surprised to see that the thing was going to last this long, uh, re-estimating just exactly how much fluid would be down there. And I uh, became uh, pretty well known for saying, well, there's a 50-50 chance we'll make it through this season. Now, this season is important because the, the altitude decline is an undulating thing with a four-month cycle, uh, the four months being half of, of Venus's year or orbit around the sun. And uh, we thought we could possibly make it through, keep pulling it up so that we could move that next rise, survive it, and that would bring us down into a decline which would be on the daylight side of the planet, yielding a lot of benefit to the science in addition to far more benefit than we could have hoped for in the first place. So as we started into this, uh, we were watching the pressure. We got through, I believe it was three, Dave, was it three maneuvers? Four maneuvers before the pressure moved one measurement. Uh, we have always held that when it moves one measurement, that's a calibration point that was done in the factory. So now we really know what the pressure is and we could get confidence and, and I expressed that. But the thing I probably forgot is that a, a pressure measurement system, which basically is a spring, uh, is sitting under pressure for 12 years, uh, probably doesn't have quite the calibration, same calibration it did 14 years ago when it was on the factory floor. And uh, so we got our surprise last Thursday that indeed we'd come to the end. Does that clarify it for you? I think it's important to say, though, that we weren't driving the altitude down using fuel. We oh. were lifting it up. Yeah. And, and, and when you run out of fuel, that, that story is over. Uh, yeah. nor, nor did we take chances. Nor did the, the failure result from the risks we were taking. We, uh, we sharpened our pencil in the very beginning of the mission we were careful, we argued among ourselves, as people like us always do, and we were careful to try to give uh, the instrument samplings as low as reasonable, but to make darn sure that all the rest of the science survived and the spacecraft survived to do the basic mission. Uh, now, though, uh, we really were ready to give over the mission to these interests, but, and indeed, again, there was some argument, how, how much shall we, pres how how much shall we devote to the probability that we can make it to the daylight against, uh, for instance, reaching very deep near midnight, which was our earliest opportunity. And in fact, we had a, I had a sleepless night worrying about the first time down. But, uh, but it all worked very well, and, and uh, we learned that, that we could get, a, get along well. And apparently, we cut it reasonably close. But that was not the reason that, uh, that it died, that we were cutting it so close. We, it was only when we completely lost control of it and it went below the depths we calculated it could survive that it died. That was 128, yes. But you can't go just by the altitude. It's very much more complicated than that because the altitude at which a given drag occurs is very sensitively <coughs> de uh, dependent on what local solar time, that is how far away you are around the planet from the, the sun hitting it, uh, that's Jerry's specialty, and we probably used a lot of hours on the telephone across the country about that subject. In addition, he, proved, he showed in his data at the beginning of the mission that in the sector of the, of the day, the, the, the early morning hours where it was going by on Venus, 
uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of variability. So one of the big problems was estimating how much to hold back against a wave, say, coming through, a wave of higher density coming through and, and uh, surprising us. And we learned, in fact, in this process, that this isn't scientific because I'm an engineer. <laughs> this isn't a science briefing. But we learned in the process that as we got down lower, the uh, predictability got better. The altitude, the atmosphere got uh, smoother, and that will be a subject of his study then. Yeah. Uh, we think the reason for that may be that uh, atmospheric waves break at around 150 kilometers as opposed to these low altitudes, 130 kilometers, where we, uh, the last measurements were obtained. There, the atmosphere is rather predictable. But at higher altitudes, we saw very, very large fluctuations, which we think are associated with uh, wave breaking. We think that process probably uh, creates the cryosphere and, and uh, prevents uh, uh, heat from moving from the day side to the night side effectively enough to, to warm up the uh, night side of Venus. Uh, I'd like to show you this uh, figure here, if you can see this, that uh, shows how the sun was trying to push periapsis down, uh, circularize the orbit and push the periapsis down, and then we were using fuel to try to increase the periapsis, and then it would uh, and we, we, would, we would try to drop it down as low as we possibly could because we were trying to study a new domain of the atmosphere and then we would kick it up and we would make decisions within hours of the time this thing might uh, burn up. And then we just finally just ran out of fuel to continue fighting the sun and um, uh, we ended up uh, going in. But it wasn't because we uh, made any miscalculation. And if we had had a little bit more fuel, the sun would have allowed us to go upwards and then we would have uh, moved around to this side here, and we would be able to survive until December. But uh, we just didn't have quite enough fuel to do that. Twelve ounces we lacked. Right, that's all. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Now being a scientist, I'm interested in the relationship between the atmosphere and the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, why does solar gravity push something down towards the atmosphere? Essentially what it does is it changes the shape of the orbit. Uh, it uh, tends to it circularize it. Sun, but as it's making the elliptical orbit, it pulls it closer to me. Yeah. It's a matter that the, the, uh, the sun, it will tend to circularize the orbit. If it circularizes it, uh, then the periapsis altitude will go up. Or if it tries to make it more eccentric uh, or, or, or more, uh, you know, pull it out further, uh, it will, it will, it will uh, take the periapsis down. So we were at a period of time when the sun tended to make it more elliptical, and that, that uh, carried the periapsis down. Okay. So the gravity is actually pulling towards the sun. It's, it's not pushing it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, it varies the shape of the ellipse, is the, what it does. The, the explanation, uh, the full explanation would be very complicated, but I think a, a concept to, to think about is that um, the gravitation of the sun uh, on the planet is balanced by the planet's orbiting, swinging around the sun. Uh, locked to the planet is the spacecraft, so the two bodies then are in orbit about the sun. Now, when the, the spacecraft is out 40,000 miles from the planet, it has a little different gravitational sense of the sun than does the planet. That difference, uh, combined with the motion of the, the spacecraft around its orbit in a very complex way, causes evolution of the shape and, and tilt of the orbit. I don't know if that helps you. Yes. Can you tell us, I've heard KNPR radio, that's the other part. Can you tell me why the Pioneer Venus mission was so important? Why did you see it Can you put it very simple terms? Yeah. Why did you see it as such an important mission? Well, one of the things, of course, that everyone should be interested in, Venus is not vastly closer to the sun than the Earth is. And the things that have happened on Venus with the climatic evolution and the surface of Venus being at about 900 degrees Fahrenheit where lead is liquid came about from some phenomenon that caused the pollution in the atmosphere. Some scientists feel that we on Earth are heading the same way if we don't continue to watch how we pollute the atmosphere. That's not to imply that we would reach the same temperature, but certainly we could reach temperatures that would be rather detrimental to plant and animal life on the Earth. Thank <laughs> you.
I have a question from Space News in Washington. I th you may have answered some of this, Richard. How much has NASA spent on operations total and uh, how much this year specifically at Ames? Well, I, I'm just on the Venus orbiter. Yeah. About between six and seven million dollars would be the Venus part of the budget since we're also flying Pioneer 10 and 11 from the same control room. Is about as close as I could get it for you. Science. That includes science. not only the operations, that includes the science, that's correct. The operations cost, as I indicated earlier, are a small part of that, and uh, as I broke it down, I broke it down only in terms of two and a half cents per year per person in the United States. If you multiply that by the population, you come up with the annual operating cost. You mentioned a figure earlier, 170 million. What's the Well, that includes both the operations cost and the cost of building the spacecraft. The operations cost, uh, not, not quite a 50-50 split, but fairly close. That's over 14 years. Yeah. That is over 14 years' time, yes. That's why I broke out the per year, per person figure separately. Let's see if we have questions from other NASA centers. Uh, I think Washington. Uh, this is Washington, uh, A.R. Hogan, Writers Plus Newsroom. I have several questions. Uh, and whichever scientist wants to, to take, take on the question is fine. Uh, a couple easy ones first. Is radar tracking by ground stations for Magellan possible to keep uh, an eye on Pioneer Venus until it does impact? And will there be anything left on the Venusian surface that you know, theoretically someday might be locatable? And I have, I have other questions. Um, I'm sure that uh, there is no uh, sensor on Earth or on uh, Magellan that could uh, sense uh, Pioneer's entry. Uh, I, titanium, for one thing, I don't know enough about materials, maybe Jack could say, suggest something else, but titanium uh, with which the propellant tanks and tubing are made is pretty well known for surviving entries at Earth and I should think would survive entry at Venus and uh, so that piping and a couple of tanks uh, might fall to the surface. Maybe some more things too, pieces of, uh, of glass. Um, I think that's all we can suggest. Does that answer the questions? Uh, in other words, this might be, a, if, if there were a vehicle or a human expedition in the distant future, you might be able to, to, uh, to find the site of impact eventually. The surface uh, of Venus My other is question is, uh, uh, here is, although uh, there are no definite plans now, there are several discovery project proposals on Venus. What post-Magellan, post-Pioneer Venus missions do you foresee or recommend, and what timeline do you expect to see those uh, missions happening? Um, I, let me answer that a little bit. I, I am now an investigator on Magellan on a similar mission uh, that we're doing here on Pioneer Venus. We dropped Magellan down uh, to about 180 kilometer altitude in September. And so now we're starting to detect uh, the atmosphere on Venus with Magellan uh, from the orbital decay. Uh, we're about five hours later than the Pioneer Venus uh, measurements. We were, we were making measurements in the morning while the Pioneer Venus measurements up until last night were made in the middle of the night. And uh, we expect to uh, make measurements uh, about eight times a day uh, for the next uh, uh, cycle on Venus, which is about seven months. Uh, so that is uh, 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 the only plan right now uh, because there is uh, going to be a cutoff on funding on Magellan. We understand at the end of fiscal year 93, uh, if there is a turnaround on that, then we would probably uh, circularize Magellan um, and uh, then we could make measurements all over the planet, all over planet Venus, uh, because we could then, if it's nearly circular, then you can uh, change the, uh, this periapsis, this closest approach, and dip down into the north, uh, say near the North Pole or near the South Pole, and gradually map the whole planet. Um, I guess there's no formal plans after that, uh, although there is various uh, uh, things that will be discussed, and San Juan Capistrano 
in November uh, different uh, possible missions for the future. In, in a planetary advisory committee environment? Yeah. Is that the questions from Washington? Could, could, yes. Could, could, you, could you just on your own uh, initiative just speculate on what you think will happen? I know there are no formal plans in place, but I mean, what, what uh, date do you see uh, further missions happening, seismic stations or more atmospheric uh, study probes and so forth? And my final question is, uh, can you uh, say something in general? One of the scientists from the University of Michigan was talking a little bit in this, but in just more general terms, can you talk about the importance of comparative planetology and, and how that is, is vital for our uh, environmental crisis here on Earth to get that, that information, please? And that is the last question from Washington. Yes, it is. Yeah, that was, uh, that was me. Uh, the, the, um, I tried to make the point uh, that, uh, that that our interest is in in atmospheres in general. Uh, obviously, there's uh, we have personal reasons for being interested in the Earth's atmosphere and how it works. Uh, but if you study only the Earth's atmosphere, um, you, the theories are not necessarily unique. You tend to tune your theories to uh, to what you see at Earth, whereas uh, measurements at Venus or at Mars in atmospheres that are quite different but are operating under the same physics give you a chance to find out how good your theories are, the ones you use at Earth. And uh, that's the underlying practical motivation uh, for, for studying other atmospheres. Uh, it's, it's kind of like if you were interested in, in what mammals were like, you probably wouldn't learn too much looking at the dog across the street or, or the cat. You probably would want to look at, at humans and uh, alligators and all kinds of animals. And you'd learn a lot more doing your research, uh, uh, trying to understand different kinds of life when you're trying to understand life at all. So uh, uh, I think the, in answer to your other question with regard to uh, future missions, uh, I think we've uh, done a, a, a very good exploratory job at Venus, but I think we do need now to move on to uh, other planets, in particular Mars. I think there'll be a lot of focus on Mars in the future. Uh, 15 or 20 years ago there were many missions to Mars and then there was a hiatus with uh, not many and then we picked up the missions to uh, to Venus, the, planet, the Pioneer Venus mission, the Magellan mission, Mars Observer that was just launched a week or so ago is on its way to Mars and uh, uh, so that's the first new Mars mission in, uh, in a decade. Uh, I would like to see us uh, do a Pioneer Venus-like mission but do it at Mars and look at the upper atmosphere, the higher atmosphere of Mars, where solar, uh, where the solar wind interacts with it, and where solar ultraviolet ionizes it, uh, which is largely what uh, uh, this mission focused on at Venus. So I think, uh, in answer to your question, that um, my interest, at least, and many of the people here, would be very much in favor of doing uh, uh, a mission to uh, to Mars of this type. Uh, the, as far as the kinds of missions NASA will do in the next. Uh, decade or two, it looks like uh, the focus will be on low-cost missions and the discovery program that NASA has proposed to Congress uh, envisions missions that uh, cost something like the Pioneer Venus mission did, 100 to 150 million dollars um, will be in favor. And some of those will go to Mars, others may go back to Venus, and uh, there will be others that will fly by comets and, uh, and will do many other things. Uh, and I think we do need to do low-cost missions so that we can do a wider variety of exploration of the, of the solar system rather than uh, the large missions which uh, look in at, at one or two planets in great detail, but uh, uh, use so much, so many funds that uh, other areas we don't get a broad uh, exploration of the planets. I, I have just one brief comment um, uh, that we are worrying about uh, the effects of CO2 uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, and uh, it looks like that the impact of of these worries will result in us spending vast quantities of money, billions, maybe trillions. Uh, to solve the CO2 problem. And here we have this natural laboratory uh, on Venus uh, to study uh, the greenhouse effect and um, uh, the other effects of CO2 uh, in atmospheres. And so it looks like an obvious uh, place to go back to uh, to get a better understanding of uh, the effects of CO2 um, um, uh, on planetary atmospheres. And I'm sure that a lot of this will apply to the planet Earth as well.
Is that it from Washington? <laughs> Any more questions from Washington? No more questions from Washington. Uh, do we have some from Johnson Space Center? This is Phil Chen, Earth News. The um, Pioneer Venus of uh, 14 years probably has um, spent more time around any planet than any other spacecraft has spent around another planet. Can you give us an estimate of how much data has been received, um, how many gigabytes of whatever data from this particular probe? Um, I don't have a number. If you can do the multiplying, uh, we, we probably had uh, several hours a day, say, uh, on the average, say, uh, yeah, I'd say six of a thousand bits a second uh, for those years. Is that uh, anybody want to help me that's with that? Right. Is that a reasonable uh, uh, that, that, order that, of magnitude? That's an approximation. Obviously, we had higher and lower bit rates, and we had almost 24 hour days early in the mission, and then we had mm -hmm. shorter days with eight hours and six hours. I, I wouldn't know how to give you a precise figure. What Jack is suggesting, though, will get you in the, within a factor of two, perhaps. Maybe before the end of this, somebody can uh, do a back of the envelope. All right. I can handle the multiplication. And uh, over this past 14 years in Delta, you had a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Can you tell us about some of those? We're still answering some of your this question. Some of your really enthusiastic um, discoveries, observations. Well, we're going to have to take that question again. We, I think we have the answer to this. It's about four times 10 to the 11th. Over, over the 14 years, I just gave you the figure for yeah. 10, 10 to the 11th. That's a we, we've had some help here suggest 10 4 times 10 to the 11th bits, bits of data. Well, what's 10 to the 11th? 10 to the 11th is a very big number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start putting commas and zeros. Now, if you can give us the next question, Houston. 100 billion. Okay, 10 to the 9th uh, is a billion. 14 years, so it's, 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 it's 100 of those. Yeah, some of the highlights uh, and lowlights, so some of the really exciting things, some of the really frustrating things. Any places where you might have uh, come close to losing the spacecraft, but your controllers were able to save it, or um, um, what would like to see Holly? I couldn't so the, the question, were there, were there dramatic fights, cliffhangers? Uh, we thought so many times. It, it, the spacecraft was designed with uh, many protections against uh, problems we would have. Uh, I guess most commonly, and it happened uh, several times, we lost communications with it to the high-gain antenna. The spacecraft uh, rotates and has uh, on it, a uh, a motor which uh, r rotates the the antenna in the opposite direction, uh, and uh, it has a reflective dish, which we on the ground uh, repoint each day, so that it will uh, communicate with Earth. Uh, sometimes by error or by uh, a charged particle in space hitting a piece of logic, uh, that antenna is thrown off point and uh, we can no longer communicate. Now, it, uh, I'm afraid this gets kind of complicated, but as it happens, one of the two receivers with which we communicate with the spacecraft um, has a bad capacitor in it, and it's very, very difficult to, to reach from Earth. Uh, and when we do reach it, uh, we can get, because of the dynamics, actually, of the motion of the spacecraft, we can only get one or two commands into it. So the trick is to is to get to it and and switch to the uh, broad the, the what we call the omni antenna the good receiver so that we can recapture it. We've been through that a number of times, uh, and it involves uh, great cooperation, literally around the world, with the Deep Space Network, who who upon whom falls a lot of uh, specialized uh, work uh, for that. Um, there are probably other instances. The last two or three years, uh, since the uh, solar panels have degraded as they naturally would that close to the sun, uh, the spacecraft has been uh, weak on power, and we've had to cycle the use of the battery. And I've often observed that uh, it has gone from a, an idiot-proof kind of operation to some degree to uh, some opportunities to uh, ruin it, certainly to uh, ruin a lot of the science it might have collected. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy and proud that uh, all of our team has uh, avoided that these years. 
Do you have Can anything? You tell us a bit about the highlights about uh, your big success. Is anything really exciting that happened in the last 14 years? What was the question? Yeah, you're asking what, 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 what were the highlights of yeah, the last 14 One years. anomaly that I referred to, of course, uh, was that we had Halley's Comet come by, as I mentioned earlier, and were able to actually get the closest measurements, pretty much, of Halley as it came by and imaged it in the ultraviolet. Other than that, in going around the planet, I don't recall any specific incident that was cause for great excitement, except when we thought we might be losing the spacecraft now and then. Well, I think it's, it's building up the whole picture, uh, the pictures that you see over here, um, by the evolving orbit and many, uh, many millions of measurements uh, throughout this whole space around, uh, around Venus, where the solar wind is interacting with it. Um, it's the building up of that picture that is the, the highlight rather than a, a single discovery. Uh, it wasn't like Columbus coming upon a new unexpected continent. We, were, we knew where we were going, we just didn't know what we would, would see in any kind of detail. Yeah, I'm, I might add that, of course, the first detailed radar map of the surface was made by the Pioneer Venus Orbiter and has subsequently been improved upon by the Magellan's higher resolution. Also, we literally got thousands of pictures of the cloud cover from the uh, cloud photopolarimeter instrument that's on the spacecraft. Okay, that, that uh, uh, completes the questions from the other centers. Do we have some more here? Because of the low temperature of the CO2 and its relatively large atomic weight, the uh, <laughs> spacecraft will be entering in at about Mach 60. 6 -0. Yeah, Six which, oh, which yeah. is, uh, you know, in the Earth's atmosphere, the velocity isn't quite as high and you're at a higher, the gas is at a much higher temperature, and so there, uh, there, there may be some interest in the uh, fact that this particular spacecraft is burning up at probably a higher Mach number than any that I can think of at the moment. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you, Bill. The uh, number of data bits turns out to be uh, 40 billion, and that's uh, a, a, a that's a, uh, half a 400 billion, and that's half a trillion, roughly half a trillion. Quarter than that. Not too well defined. <laughs> right. Okay. All right, well, I, I guess that uh, completes this uh, occasion. Uh, we will be showing uh, the video background tape uh, after the questions are concluded and the questions are concluded. Thank you very much. I'm not sure what television coverage I have.